Welcome to Trinity Central. We exist to make God central to our lives and our world. You are listening to a recording of one of our Sunday messages. For more information, please go to trinitycentral.org. It's always wonderful to get up here on a Sunday morning and just process the different words that have come and recognize how much of what I'm going to be speaking about this morning has already, in that sense, been spoken about um, through the different words that have come. Uh, so uh, we're going to take... Well, let me just say, Happy Easter! <laughs> Happy Easter! It's such a wonderful thing that we get to come and celebrate on a day-to-day. Didn't the band lead us so magnificently this morning? So great. Just so wonderful to be able to worship uh, and to enjoy God's presence in the way that we have this morning. Um, Christians around the world, we're joining uh, tens, hundreds of millions of Christians celebrating the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ around the world, in city after city, town after town, village after village. What we're doing here this morning is happening all over the world. Isn't it an incredible thing to think? Hundreds of millions of people gathering to celebrate the fact that He is risen. Now, what I'd like to do this morning is I'd like to have a look at a story uh, that leads up to the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, It's a story of a man, uh, well, actually, uh, uh, two sisters and a brother, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And Lazarus falls ill, and the the two girls send for Jesus. Uh, But Jesus delays his coming, delays his coming a couple of days. And by the time Jesus arrives, Lazarus is dead. In fact, by the time Jesus leaves, Lazarus is already dead. And... um, And we'll discover why, in that sense, Jesus delays. Um, But what I'd like to do is I'd like just to to open it with the the gospel writer, John, uh, who was one of Jesus' followers, would have been a a, a first-hand witness of everything that happened that day, uh, was, was observing Jesus closely, and he opens the story with these words. He says, Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus, of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary and Martha have appeared a number of times in John's gospel, and so we're actually quite well acquainted with them. If you, if you read the gospels, uh, you'll find that there's a real friendship, a, a great love that Jesus has for this family. Uh, and he comments, it was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So, The sisters sent to him saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. What a beautiful way of expressing uh, the, the friendship that Jesus had with Lazarus. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Um, Now, Bearing in mind that at this point, Jesus, uh, Lazarus was already dead. Jesus and his disciples or his followers were a couple of days' walk from Bethany. Um, By the time they set off, uh, Lazarus was already dead. So it's an interesting thing that Jesus says, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. And so this morning, as we consider Jesus' resurrection, we're going to engage with this story about Lazarus and how Lazarus' death was for the glory of God, how Jesus saw that. So why don't we just pray for a moment? Father, we just thank you so much for the joy of this morning, for the joy of celebrating. And I pray, Lord God, that you would speak through me this morning. I pray, Father, that you would come and move among us and let your Holy Spirit touch our hearts, that we might know and see Jesus afresh today, whether whether we've uh, known Jesus over 20 years or whether we've never really met him. I pray that this morning we would encounter the living, risen Lord Jesus. 
In your wonderful name we pray it. Amen. 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 So just a little bit of background. As I said, Mary, Martha and Lazarus, two sisters and a brother, dearly loved by Jesus. They're a couple of days away uh, from where Jesus receives the, uh, the, the, the summons, the come quickly, please, uh, the one that you love is ill. And Jesus delays for a couple of days. Um, and uh, so by the time he arrives in Bethany, <coughs> excuse me, Lazarus has already been in the grave for four days. Now, when Jesus arrives, before he actually gets to the village, the sisters hear that he's uh, on his way. And so Martha, uh, Martha's kind of the action girl. Um, and you'll see that from other stories in, in John's gospel. Um, she rushes out of the village and meets him before he even arrives in the village. Uh, but in turn, both of these sisters actually say the identical thing to Jesus. They say to him, if only you had been here, Lazarus would not have died. Jesus, Lord, they call him, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Literally, they say the exact same sentence to Jesus, both in turn, both out of each other's hearing. They say the same thing. And what's fascinating about this story is that Jesus uh, responds to each of that, those, those sisters saying exactly the same thing in two very different ways. Now, both of these sisters have observed Jesus healing people. And that's why they're essentially saying, if only you'd been here, you would have healed him. We have real faith that you are a healer. And we know that if you'd been around when he'd got ill, that you would have healed him. But now it's too late. If only, if only the sisters are, are grappling with the fact that Jesus was not there. And so what I'd like to do is I'd like to start just by considering the two responses that Jesus gives to these two sisters. And then we'll come to Lazarus and we'll come to ourselves after that. So the first response uh, we read it from verse 17. Uh, now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and to Mary to console them concerning their brother. So uh, obviously they were a family that were well known in Jerusalem. People had come out from the city to be uh, with them. And there was a real sense that when people died in the community, that, that the community would come out and mourn together. There was a very, mourning was a very public thing in, in, in the Jewish community. And uh, so when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask God, God will give to her, give to you. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who's coming into the world. It's fascinating sometimes how we can say yes and still not get it. She really does not have a clue what he's saying, but she's agreeing with him at this point. Now, what Jesus does with Martha is he, t he tells her the truth. He speaks to her. He tells her the truth about life and death, and he tells her the truth about himself. He says, to start off with, Mary Lazarus is going to rise again. It's a spectacularly ambiguous statement. Uh, Lazarus is going to rise again. Mary, Mary responds, I know, Lord. And she repeats what she understands from her Jewish perspective on death. At the end of the age, 
uh, on the last day when everyone is resurrected, Lazarus also will rise again. She's referring to heaven. She's saying in that last moment, Lazarus is going to be raised into heaven. It's funny, isn't it, how philosophical people become around death. They often say whimsical things about the person who's passed away. They kind of whitewash their life with goodness, don't they? Oh, he was such a good person. No, he wasn't. He was a rotter. No, no he was such a good person. Uh, uh, and even, even we, we say silly things like, oh, we'll see him again in heaven, even if we're not sure whether we believe in an afterlife. We make statements like that. And the question we should be asking ourselves is, if there is a heaven, why should God bring us into heaven? What, guarantee, what guarantees us this outcome that God should say, yes, sure, you should come in. You should come and be with me for eternity. So just as we do that, Martha does that in this moment. She repeats her philosophy. And we can repeat our philosophy without really giving it any thought as to whether we believe it and why we believe it, whether it stands up to reason. Now, listen to Jesus' response to her. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? What does Jesus do here? Jesus makes the whole question of life and death and resurrection and eternity all about himself. It's actually a pretty staggering statement that he makes. He doesn't say, Martha, Lazarus was a good man. Of course he'll rise again. Neither does he say, Martha, let's face it. Lazarus was far from perfect. There are no guarantees. Why, why do you think he would ever rise again? See, Jesus does not make a moralistic argument. And what we tend to think that Christianity is, is a moralistic religion. We tend to think it's about doing the right thing, saying the right thing, getting it right. If you behave well, you'll get into heaven. If you behave badly, you won't. We tend to think of Christianity as this moralistic religion. If you obey the law, then you'll get in. If you don't obey the law, then you won't get in. But Jesus does not make a moralistic argument here at all. He says, some people will live even though they die, but others will stay dead. Others will go, will go to kind of a complete death. So the ramification of the statement that he is about to make is absolutely massive for every person on earth who at some point will die. And that's pretty much the only thing any of us are ever guaranteed of. Okay? Okay? Could be today, could be tomorrow, could be 30 years, 50 years, 70 years time. But that is the one thing that we are all guaranteed, that we will die. So Jesus makes this surprising statement that the thing that determines the outcome of where we end up with relationship to death and to life is all dependent on on him and not on whether you've been a bad person or a good person. That's a pretty staggering thing to say. In other words, Jesus is saying, your future in relation to life and death is totally bound up with your relationship with me. Now, you've got to stop at this point, if you're a rational person, you've got to stop at this point and say, surely this is the most ludicrous statement any human being can make. You have to. You have to, you have to say, only, only God could make a statement like that. Only God could say your, to every person in the world, your destiny, your future, your eternity, whether you live or die, heaven or hell, 
It is totally wrapped up with me. Only God can surely make a statement like that. No human could possibly say these words with any sense of gravitas. Now, there, we're familiar with the fact that there are people all through the centuries who have stated things like this. People with God complexes, Napoleon complexes, people who've thought that they were ultimately God. Maybe they gathered a few followers, but ultimately they couldn't be trusted and they disappeared. So at this point, we should shut the book on Jesus and say, you are mad. That's what we should say to Jesus. On the basis of this statement, we should look at him and say, you are mad. I'm not going to listen to another thing you say. Thank you very much. That's That's the rational reaction to Jesus. We should walk away. Unless, unless Jesus is actually who he said he was. That he was God who had clothed himself in human flesh, in humanity, in order to come and reveal himself to his creation. If Jesus was that, if Jesus was God, then these words have such powerful impact, such ramification for each and every single one of us. And so what we're left with is a decision that we have to make. Who was Jesus? When Jesus says these things to to Mary and to Martha, who was he? Did he have authority to say this? Or was he just another lunatic? If he's simply another man, why bother with him? It's irrelevant. But if he's God, what he's saying in this moment has ultimate relevance to every single one of us who will ever walk, set our feet on this planet. Now we'll come back to this, this shortly, but I just want to continue with the implications of this conversation because it's fascinating. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Jesus tells Martha that when our relationship with Jesus becomes one of belief, and trust in Him, then our relationship with death also changes. Let me say that again. Jesus is telling Martha, when your relationship with me becomes one of belief and trust, your relationship with death also changes. What Jesus is saying is is really quite fascinating. fascinating. He doesn't say, I raise people from the dead. This is something I do. He doesn't even say, I give people life. No, Jesus says something altogether more profound than that. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus literally defines himself as resurrection and life. Jesus points to himself as the ultimate source of these things. Internally, he is this. Standing before them, in, clothed in a man's body, Jesus is saying, I am literally life and resurrection exploding in this moment. That's who I am. It's kind of cloaked in this flesh, but that's what I am. And then he says, whoever believes in me, though he die, yet will he live. So the person who has a relationship with Jesus Sees, begins to see death differently. Rather than seeing death as the end of life, the person who has a, a relationship with Jesus is saying, actually, when I come to death's door, yet will I live. Death is becoming literally a doorway into a whole new experience of life. Death is literally becoming a gateway that we go through into an eternity with God, which is so much more glorious and beautiful than this life is because in that life there is no hint of evil. There's no hint of wickedness. There's nothing that the the brokenness of this current world that we live in day by day by day that we experience that affects us in all kinds of ways is not present in that world. So for the person who believes, Jesus is saying, your whole relationship with death changes. 
And then he concludes with this statement. He says, and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. So what Jesus is talking about here is not just a temporary extension to life, like what he would give to Lazarus. What he's actually talking about is an eternity with God. Most incredible gift that God could give us. And then Jesus asks Martha a question. He says, do you believe? Do you believe, Martha? Jesus is putting her on the spot, like he's doing with us today. Jesus wants to put us on the spot and ask us that question. Do you believe? Do you believe? Will you believe? So having told Martha the truth about himself, the truth about life and death and resurrection, he asks her to respond to him. He kind of draws faith out of her. What's happening in this moment is Jesus is inviting her into faith. And actually, as I'm speaking this morning, Jesus is doing the exact same thing for you and for me. He's inviting us into faith. He's seeking to draw it out of us. He's saying, come in, come in. I have something for you. So often we try to qualify ourselves before God. What what, what we do is we go back to that moralistic argument, don't we? But I'm a good person, we say. Or maybe we do the opposite. Maybe, I think it was Grace who shared this morning. It's like, actually, if you knew me, you would never choose me. You'd never choose me. I know the way I think. I know the way I am. You'd never choose me. Actually, Sam said it. I wouldn't even choose myself. (laughs) And Jesus says, it's not based on a moralistic argument. It's based on a relationship with me. Now, the second person we meet in the story is Mary. And Mary had been saved from a terrible life in sin. And so Mary is this picture of someone who we might say, I'm a bit like that. I wouldn't be chosen. I wouldn't be the one that you would look for. And Mary is like a picture of that for us. Mary is this woman who's lived in a a life of sin and shame. And how does Jesus respond to her? She comes and asks him the same question. In verse 32, it says, Now, when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet saying, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, the Lord come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. Now, Jesus' response to Mary is so different to his response to Martha. Here we get a glimpse, I guess, into Jesus' emotional world. We find a a surprising mix of tender and outrage, of compassion and anger. We find this tenderness in the way that Jesus uh, cares for for Mary. He, He weeps with her. He doesn't have many words. He doesn't say much to her. He just, in that moment, he holds the moment with her. He just identifies with her grief. And even though Jesus knows that in a few minutes I'm going to do something that will totally wipe away all your tears, Jesus still identifies with what she's going through. Isn't that amazing? He's going to change the situation, but he still loves. He still draws very, very close. He weeps with her. Jesus wept. We experience that those who are looking on are experiencing, wow, this guy is so full of love. See how he loved him. People who don't know him from a bar of soap are commenting on this. Jesus doesn't shy away about, from telling us the truth about ourselves, but he also loves us so compassionately. And when he tells us the truth, he does it with such love in his heart. But what's interesting is that John, and I I mentioned John is the writer of this text. John is one of Jesus' followers. 
John is observing and probably observing very closely what's going on in this moment. And John tells us that Jesus was, and in our English translations we read these words, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. Now this is actually a very poor translation. Uh, Kath was talking about Germany. Actually the German translations of the Bible get this much more accurate. Uh, Literally it says that he was outraged. Jesus boiled over with anger. Jesus had this righteous anger that kind of welled up within him and kind of wanted to explode out of him as he looked at death and the carnage that it was reaping among his friends and he saw the reality of what was going on. Jesus, when our lives are shattered, maybe when we lay a spouse in the grave, or when a parent walks through the agony of laying their child to rest, or when a a nation attacks another nation and unspeakable violence is done, the heart of God both feels compassion for us, but there's also this outrage, there's this anger, there's this sense of what is going on here? This is not what I want for my creation. This is not what I want for my people. And all oh, that outrage should make us so glad. <laughs> should make us feel safe in the hands of God, actually, that God feels that way. Maybe this is the most revealing moment of Jesus' identity as God in the flesh, as the anger that he feels against death kind of explodes out of him. So we move to Lazarus. Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead for four days. Okay, clearly she hasn't quite understood what Jesus is about to do. So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! The man who had died came out. Can you imagine that moment? Can you imagine witnessing this guy kind of shuffling out in his grave clothes, coming out of the grave, all bound up? (laughs) People are just staggered, so Jesus has to say, unbind him. Let him go. In this moment, Jesus Christ shows the world, I have power over death. That's what's going on here. And so this question that we have to answer that I asked earlier on, is he mad or is he God? We've got to decide, is this true? Is this true? Does Jesus have power over death? Is he really mad or is this God coming in the flesh? See, friends, this story is not just about Mary and Martha and Lazarus. This story is about you and me. This is the truth for us today. When I was a child, I had very bad asthma. And one day I um, was at somebody else's house and they had a, a dog and they had a, one of those old chemical flea collars. And uh, I, touch, I, I petted this dog, touched the flea collar and had a violent allergic reaction and that was followed by an asthma attack. And my panicked parents phoned the doctor and they said, what do we do? And the doctor said, "Uh, if you do not get him to hospital, he will die. Get him to hospital as fast as you possibly can. We were quite a way out of the city, so it didn't make sense to send an ambulance to get me. He just said, get get on the road, get him there. Now, the doctor told my parents the truth. If If they wasted time, they would lose me. That he told them the truth. But that truth wasn't harsh. He didn't tell them the truth to shame them. It wasn't because the doctor didn't love me that he told them the truth. It was probably the most loving thing the doctor could do was tell them the truth. Move. Get on. Go. Don't hesitate. 
Get in the car and go. It was probably said with a huge amount of compassion. That doctor did not want me to die. He wanted me to live. In fact, the doctor had a solution for my situation. Get him to the hospital where doctors can care for him with the right equipment. And so they rushed me to the hospital. I was put on a nebulizer. I was given Ventolin and other medication. And here I am today. Yay. Yeah, I'm glad about that too. They saved my life. Hallelujah. Jesus is like that doctor. Jesus looks us in the eye and he tells us the truth about our lives, about our sin, about our brokenness. He doesn't cover it up. He tells us the truth. But like this doctor, he's not doing it because he wants to shame us. He's doing it because he has a solution for us, because he loves us. He also, just as he told Martha the truth, he loved Mary with such compassion, and he loves us with compassion. He tells us the truth with compassion. I want the truth to sink into your brain. Why do I want to do that? Because I want you to understand your predicament, and I want you to come to me for the solution. That is what Jesus is doing. Jesus tells us the truth. Jesus has compassion for us. And the reason that all of this comes together is that what was happening in this moment as Jesus was raising Lazarus from the dead is that Jesus was sealing his own death warrant. See, what happened immediately after this is the Pharisees gathered together, the the ruling party, the Sanhedrin, they came together and they said, what are we going to do with this guy who's raising the dead? The problem is he is developing such a following. And when people hear that he has, he has brought Lazarus out of the tomb, when people understand that this guy can raise the dead, we will have a massive problem on our hands. Jesus has to die. And Jesus Christ knows that the only way to save us, the solution, that hospital that we need, is for him to die. You better answer that. Jesus knows the only way to keep Lazarus alive is for him to die. And so Jesus chooses to go to death on your behalf and on my behalf. You've got to ask the question, is he mad or is he God? Is he mad or is he God? And so unlike those people with God complexes who... Uh, maybe gathered 5, 10, 15, maybe 100 followers if they were really persuasive. Today, we look around the world, and in this moment, hundreds of millions of Christians are lifting their hands in worship and saying, you are risen. Why do they have such confidence? Why is it that they think that way? And could it be that this morning, Jesus is saying the same thing to you that he said to Lazarus. Come out of the grave. Come out of the grave. See, Jesus recognizes that we are in death, that the end of our lives will be death because we are in death already. And Jesus submitted himself to our death in order to break the chains of death and to rise again in glorious life and to say, my heart for you, my people, my creation, is to give eternal life to you, to draw you into fellowship with me, to bring you into all that I have made for you. And so if you're a Christian uh, this morning, you you need to understand the, the, the breadth, the vastness of what he's brought you into. It's life and life in abundance. And maybe you're here this morning and you would say, I, I'm, I'm still working this out. I'm still trying to decide. What, what do I think? Is he mad? Or is he God? Maybe, maybe even as you're sitting here, you're beginning to, to feel the sense of, yeah, I think I do believe in him. Jesus invites you this morning, come out of the grave. When I was a kid, I heard Jesus shout, Reese, come out. And I came out of the grave. And Jesus changed my life completely. For you this morning, Jesus is saying your name. He's saying your name, Joe. He's saying your name, Michael. He's saying your name.
He sang your name. Come out. Can you hear? Can you hear him? I wonder if I could ask the band to come on up. I wonder whether I could ask you all to stand. Just in this moment, we're going to take just a moment. Why don't you just for a moment close your eyes? <laughs> if you're a Christian here this morning, I think Jesus wants to say to you, come in. There's more. There's more for you. If you've never put your trust in Jesus this morning, he's saying, come on out. Run out of that grave. Come into the life that I have for you. Holy Spirit, we just welcome you this morning. We love the way that you move among us. We love how you exalt Jesus among us. And right now, I just ask you that you would come and overshadow us, that you'd draw us to all that you have for us. Jesus says to you this morning, I love you. I'm committed to you. If you will bow your knee to me, if you will confess your sin to me, you will be born again of the Holy Spirit and I will give you the gift of life and life eternal. It's a promise. He says, I will do it. Jesus says, you haven't been good enough for me. It's impossible. You couldn't. And he says, you can't be so bad that you're beyond my love for you. Yeah. It's not based on moralism. It's based on a relationship. And Jesus invites you right now, he invites me to just come, to come to him. So if you uh, would be open to that, why don't you just lift your hands, just in a way of saying, I'm open to you, Jesus. And maybe you've never made a decision to trust Jesus. If that's you, why don't you just say to Jesus right now, I'm open to you. Would you show me your love? Would you show me that you're real? Would you let faith come alive in my heart just say that to him simple as that maybe you want to go further than that maybe you want to say this morning I choose to believe I choose to put my trust in you I know you have life for me and I want to choose that life today and if that's you I'd love to invite you at the end of the meeting just to come on down and pray with us, chat with one of us. I'd love to pray with you.